Well, hello there. My name is Beth Gaff, and I am the technology trainer here at the Peabody Public Library in Columbia City, Indiana. And first off, I just want to let you know that this class is geared to go at your pace, which means that you can stop this, go away from this, and come back to this at any time. You're under no obligation to sit through this entire class in one setting. You can always pause it and come back to the time that you paused it at. I get a lot of requests for some things about what I should be doing with my computer to help keep it clean and harmful of all those nasty viruses that are out there and malware and spyware and etc etc. So I figured that I would create a class to kind of help and guide those that are inquiring about that. Um, my information is listed here, so if you need to get in contact with me, you can do so at any time by sending me an email or giving me a call. Uh, but I want to go ahead and get started on this class, and uh, these are just simple things that computer users should know. These are the items that we're going to be discussing today in class. We're going to be setting up a simple backup system. I'm going to tell you about some of those systems that you can activate as well as the one that comes with your computer. Um, learning about our shortcuts, being able to do everything a little bit faster with those shortcuts, being able to protect yourself from viruses, keeping your PC free of junk, accessing your home computer from anywhere to get those files that you may have left behind, perform regular maintenance, sharing files between online storages, and keeping your personal information safe and secure. These are very, very simple tasks that we can do on a daily, weekly, monthly type basis to keep our computers safe from harm as well as our own personal um, information and files as well. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so let's get started with setting up a simple backup system. So these are just some things to keep in mind when it comes to setting up a simple backup system. And I'm actually gonna be doing a demo here in a minute to show you some of these softwares that I'm talking about. Uh, but keep in mind that your hard drive eventually will fail. Um, if it hasn't happened to you yet, then you're very, very lucky. Uh, but eventually something will happen, whether you do it accidentally or your computer just comes crashing down on you. At one, some point or another, uh, your hard drive is going to fail on you. Um, just, may, just set it up and forget it. So you can get yourself set up on a backup plan that will automatically set it up for you so you don't even have to remember to do it. It will just do it. You can also back up things to the internet and we're going to be talking a little bit more about that. You can back up to an external drive. Um, you should always have more than one backup just in case your other backup isn't backing up quite right. And uh, you can do it today and make sure you pass it on to someone else. And again, I'm going to be showing you that demo. No matter how tech savvy you are, there are certain things every one of us has to deal with when using a computer. And we don't always want to deal with them in the most efficient ways. So here are some things that everybody can do to try to get their computer a little faster, a little safer, and a little bit easier to use. So here in the at least um, the last month or so, I've had family and friends and uh, neighbors asking me how to recover data from a failed hard drive. Um, I help them as best as I can, but in my head, my answer is always going to be the same. Go back in time, back up your computer like you know you should have done to begin with. Um, but, you know, it's not always that simple. When your computer's hard drive fails, it can be gut-wrenching at best. Maybe you lost really important presentation you were working on and at worst maybe you've lost every photo of your kid's childhood uh, but often it got it's gone forever unless you want to pay a lot of money to get it back and who wants to do that um, every high hard drive does fail at one day um, you can use backup services like uh, backblaze says 50 percent of their fails after four years save yourself the trouble and start backing up your computer now so there are links you can get on. Lifehacker has some really great links you can get on on how to recover your data when your hard drive actually does go belly up on you. Um, but just keep in mind that one day your hard drive will fail. It's my firm belief that everyone will experience this at least once in their life. Maybe you've accidentally erased your data. Maybe you lost your computer. Or maybe your hard drive just dies. It's inevitable. One day you will lose all of your data. Many of you probably have already experienced this. 
Um, and for those of you that haven't, well, you're very lucky that you haven't quite yet. Um, it's a scary thought, but it doesn't have to be. Um, I can think of several, several different cat catastrophe losses in the past few years that I've gone through, but none of them were particularly stressful because I was able to restore from a backup and keep going. You know, what shocks me the most about those hard drive failures is that every single person I talk to, just about everyone admits that they knew they should have been backing up and they just weren't. Uh, they know what backup means and they even know what an external hard drive is. They might even have one. They just seem to think they can do it tomorrow and keep pushing it back one more day and their hard drive inevitably will just junk out on them and it's going to stop. Um, everyone has something to lose. Maybe it's family photos. Maybe it's important work materials. Maybe it's your uh, finally crafted resume you work so hard on. Backing up isn't just for computer geeks with lots of complex data. It's something each and every one of us needs. So backing up is easy. Just set it and forget it. So now you know you should back up and that's left. Um, all that's left is actually to do it. Luckily, I have some guides just to get you through this. You do have two choices when it comes to backup. You can back up to the internet, which is usually recommended with a program called Crash Plan or Backblaze. Uh, this is preferred. It's very easy to set up and it ensures that your data is kept safe even if your house catches fire or gets burglarized. And if you have a lot of data that you can send out on a hard drive for initial backup. You can also back up to an external drive uh, with Windows 7 backup, Windows 8 file history, or OS X. Uh, incredibly easy to use time machine. You can also back up to an external drive with crash plan um, as I talked about earlier. External drives are okay, but this method won't protect you in case of fire or theft. If you use an external drive, you should still back up your most important files to an online service like Dropbox um, if, they, if it doesn't take up too much space. Check out the guides um, about backup methods. And um, now we're going to talk about why you should always have more than one backup. Your data really isn't safe unless you're backing up properly with lots of uh, different kinds of different backups that you're using or however you have experienced it. So if you're not convinced yet, if so, stop whatever you're doing right now and put it on your to-do list. Got a free hour tonight? Do it tonight. Got a, free, uh, got a bit of free time this weekend? Skip the movies and set your first backup. Then uh, the movies will still be there next weekend. This is not something you can afford to keep pushing back. Most importantly, pass it on. If you already have a backup or if you're officially planning to do so, uh, let your friends know how important it is and how easy it is. If you don't, you'll have to hear about it the next time they lose something important. So make sure you pass along those important needed uh, backup plans that you have. That way your friends are fully aware of that as well. But right now, I'm going to go into a demonstration for us. So we're going to take a look at some of these backup plans. All right, so now it's time for a backup demonstration. And I am just going to go into Internet Explorer and pull up um, that some of those items that I was talking to you about earlier. Um, we can look up that Backblaze as well as Crash Plan. So I'm just going to type in Backblaze and uh, go into there. And this is backup Backblaze. This does a personal backup, a business backup, the B2 cloud storage backup. Uh, let's see, meet personal backup. So we're going to go ahead and push on that. Evidently, this is something that you do have to purchase. However, they do have a free trial that allows you to back up these items. Um, and these are Lifehacker, and this is primarily who this class is sponsored to us from today. Uh, they are a part of and sponsored, affiliated with um, this particular one. So this is why they would have us do it. Um, they have different ways that you can do a backup. So this is the Backup Blaze Unlimited. Uh, and again, if we wanted to go into pricing in the buying guide of how much this would cost us, we're looking at $5 a month, $50 for the year, or 
$100 for two years. So you're saving some additional money. And this is basically just doing a personal type backup for yourself. Okay. So now let's go back and take a look at uh, Crash Plan. See what they have to offer. This is an online data backup. I'm sure it's going to come up anytime now and we'll be able to get on there. Here it comes. All right, so you can get started for free. Again, it's a type of free trial. Some of the features uh, that you can have with this, it allows you to do it uh, through several different devices, the crash plan. You can set up data security, unlimited storage to keep your those backups in. And what these backups are good for is that crashing purpose. So if your computer would crash, you'd be able to go back to the last backup that you did. And if you haven't done a backup in a couple of years, then all everything you've done up to that point is going to be lost. So making sure that you're doing these backups is pretty essential. Um, these are just some smart type backups that you can do. We could try it free. We can sign in. Here's our menu options that it gives us. So let's look at a different one. Let's look at some of the free backup plans that we can go to. So I'm just going to come in here and type free backups. How, actually, let's type in free computer backups. Who knows what we'll get if we just type in backups. Um, okay, so some of these are, here are six free online backup plans that you could go with. This is through LifeWire. Um, MI Media, it's 10 gigs of free storage. iDrive Basic, 5 gigs of free online storage. Um, and this is where you could put some of those documents and pictures and anything of importance for yourself. Here's the best backup line, uh, backup services of 2017. This is from PC Magazine. Ooh, we have a nice little chart on this one. So you would be able to use iDrive, Crash Plan, SOS Online, Open Drive. Let's see what, see. And this kind of tells you what you're getting. With the iDrive, you're getting one terabyte, which is a lot of memory. Um, some of these other ones, you're getting unlimited memory, whereas some of the other ones, you aren't getting as much. But I'll tell you what, 50 gigs is quite a bit, so... Don't let that discourage you. Um, whichever ones do continuous backups, full disk backups, file sharing, things along those lines. So uh, the best way to really figure out what's going to work for you and your backup system, and actually I do want to go into the Windows backup, is just to kind of get in here and research. Like I, So for you Windows 10 people, let's look up the Windows 10 backup. And according to this, um, how to back up Windows 10, backups are essential part of routine. So it talks about file backup, system backup. And here we go. So update and security, you can actually go into that, um, your little uh, gear wheel there, which is your settings, go into your backup. And then from here, you can actually start to backup file history um, or look for an older version. And uh, this will let you know how to set that up. It's very, very step-by-step -step for you. And this is Windows 10 users. So let's try Windows 8 users. Uh, I do believe that it would be very similar. Um, and again, this would just be backup and restore, which is at your start menu. And, uh, okay, well, we aren't ready for that. Well, here, let's just listen to it for a minute and we'll just kind of move well, on like from that. Here we go. Hi, my name is Roger Rahuja, and I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about the backup program in Windows 8. There are actually two different backup programs in Windows 8. The first one is the same as Windows 7. In Windows 7, it was called Backup and Restore. In Windows 8, it's called Windows 7 File Recovery. This program functions the same way Backup and Restore function in Windows 7. And we're going to start by looking at that. I start by hitting the Windows key on my keyboard, getting to the Start menu, and we'll do a search for Windows 7 File Recovery. 
And under settings here, there it is. <clears throat> now, the first time that you go in here, you're going to see um, something that says setup backup. I've already done this, so that's why we're coming to this screen. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and change settings, which will take us to the same screen that you would be seeing once you hit setup backup. So here we're going to set up the backup. I'm going to select which drive I want to back up to, and I'm going to hit next. I'm going to let Windows choose. Um, what this will do is um, it'll back up everything on your computer, your programs, your data files, everything on your computer. Creates an image which you can use to restore, and it can put the computer back to the state that it was in uh, when the backup was made. So I'll hit next here. And then um, the schedule, I like to change it. Windows 7 um, defaulted to daily, I'm sorry, to weekly. I like to um, do it on a daily basis. And so I'm going to select that. And then at this point, I would just hit save settings and exit, and we would start an immediate backup. Um, as I said, I like this particular version in that it backs up everything. Um, the disadvantage was obviously it's going to back up at 7 p.m. and if you wait, if you've been working all day on something and your hard drive happens to crash at 6 p.m. before the backup, you're going to lose whatever you were working on. So to that effect, um, Microsoft came out with their file history program, which is the other backup program. So I'm going to cancel out of here and we're going to close this. Go back to our start menu and go to file history. And um, right here is file history. Now file history, all you have to do is select where it's going to back up to and hit turn on. And it will basically make a backup um, of your data files. It's going to back up anything that's in a library and it's going to back it up on the fly. So it's very um, similar to Time Machine, if any of you are familiar with the Apple product. Um, the um, it, It'll back up on the fly as it's going along. So you could be working all day. You won't lose any data. It's great in that respect. I feel it's lacking in that it doesn't create an image of the system as well. I think it would uh, uh, behoove Microsoft to change this so that it creates an image of the system and backs up on the fly. And um, that's basically it. Those are the two different backup programs. All right. So he gave us a really, really good explanation of Windows 8 even into Windows 7. So I don't even think I need to go any further. He did such a great job. But if you want to research a little bit more about backups and how important they are and how you can get going, the Internet is your friend. So uh, definitely get on there. Check out YouTube and check out some of the videos that are available to you. All right, moving right along. So hopefully you got a little bit better understanding of backups and how to get those and how you can retrieve yours that comes with your computer. And now I'm going to talk to you about some very basic keyboard shortcuts that can kind of make your life a little bit easier and uh, get you through the day. Some of these would can, would be uh, the control plus the F key, which is a fine command. Uh, control plus the N, which is creating something new. Control plus the S, which is saving a document. Control plus P, which is printer options. The Alt plus F4, which is quitting a current application pressing enter um, instead of clicking, as well as um, we're going to be able to see some more shortcuts on the next page. On the next slide, I've got some more cheats on there for you, but we're going to get into this right away. So according to uh, a statistic published in the Atlantic, 90% of computer, computer users don't know what Control plus F can do. As a result, we've put together a list of common handy shortcuts and tricks that every computer user should know. If you have a friend or family member who could use the lesson or refresher, you can uh, let them know all about this, so that way they can save some time as well. So before we actually get started, let's tackle some basics. The control, which is your CTRL, is an abbreviation, um, and it is the main key on your Windows PC uh, that you use the keyboard for the shortcuts, and that's typically in the bottom left-hand corner of your keyboard. You're going to see that control button there. Um, if you have a Mac, you can also you also have a control key, but you pri but your primary keyboard shortcut key is command. So 
So like Alt slash Option and Shift, these are modifier keys. When you press them, nothing obvious happens. When you press them along with another letter or number, however, you can make your computer do things faster. So I'm going to talk to you about some handy shortcuts you can use with these particular keys. So the Control plus F or the Command plus F if, F if you have a Mac. Obviously, we have to begin with Control plus F since, since uh, that particular statistic is begging for it. Control plus F or Command plus F. F on a Mac is the keyboard sh shortcut for find. Uh, it's a find command. If you're in a web browser and you want to search text on a web page, pressing Control plus F will bring up a search box. Just type in that search box and it'll locate the text you're typing on the page. Control plus F may work in another application too when you need to find something. For example, Microsoft Word and other word processing applications use this keyboard shortcut as well. So keep that in mind for Control plus F or Command plus F if you're using a Mac. This is going to help you find things when you're on the internet or other types of programs that you may have on the computer. Control plus N or Command plus N if you're using a Mac. Pr pressing the Control plus N or Command plus N um, is the command for creating something new. So in a web browser, this will make a new window. In a word, pro word processing or image editing or other document-based application, this keyboard shortcut will create a new document. Um, also, the Control S or Command plus S um, on a Mac. Now that you know how to create a new document with your keyboard, you should also know how to save one. Control plus S or Command plus S on Mac is the keyboard shortcut for saving a document. Um, if this is the first time you've saved a document, you'll be presented with a new window that'll ask you what to name it and where you want to save it. If you've already saved it once before, this keyboard shortcut will simply save your changes. You also have the Control P or Command plus P on a Mac. If you want to print the document you just made, Control plus P or Command plus P is the keyboard shortcut that will open the print window. From there, you'll be able to check your settings, choose a printer, etc. When you're ready, just click print and your document will be printed. This keyboard shortcut works, uh, works in pretty much any application with printable content, including your web browser. Now, switching gears a little bit, pressing that Alt button, that is just a couple keys over from that control, plus your F4, which would be those um, function keys you have lined up along the top. Now, if you have a Chromebook, you have browser keys, so this would be slightly different for you. Uh, but the Alt F4 and sometimes Control plus W or Control plus Q or Command plus Q on a Mac is the keyboard shortcut for quitting the current application. In Windows, it will quit the current, um, the currently open that's in focus on the screen. On a Mac, this is also generally the case, but sometimes it's not as clear. To know which application is going to quit when you perform this keyboard command, just look in the upper left can, hand corner to see its name. So you're just kind of going to have to play around with that a little bit to see how that's going to benefit you, that quitting a current application. You also have enter or return on a Mac. The enter key or return key on a Mac is useful for a lot of things. When a dialog window pops up and asks you to press OK or cancel, you can usually just press enter instead of clicking OK. In Windows, you can tell which button will respond to enter because it'll have a dotted box inside of it. On the Mac, the button will be blue instead of gray. Enter can also be used for other things like submitting forms on web pages from any text field in that form. Um, there are just a few shortcuts to get you started. You can also learn more about shortcuts by going on to YouTube and looking up shortcuts. You can also get on to the internet like we did with those backups and just look up some keyboard shortcuts for yourself and see what's going to benefit you. Um, on the next slide, we're going to be I'm going to be showing you some of them are duplicated, but there are some other shortcuts that might be able to help you a little bit better as well. Here's some more of those shortcuts I was talking about. You have the Control plus X, which is a cut feature. Control plus C, which is a copy feature. Control plus V, which is a paste feature. Control plus Z, which will undo something you've done in a document. 
Control plus Y will redo it. Control plus B will bold it. Control plus I will do the italics. And again, we've already learned about Control plus S, which is save. And then your F12 function will save as something. So again, there are tons and tons and tons of different kinds of keyboard shortcuts that you can find for yourself. Go ahead and do that now. Look online right now and see what kind of keyboard shortcuts you can find that's going to help you out. All right, so let's talk about protecting ourselves from viruses, shall we? Um, all we hear about anymore on the news is about all of these terrible things that are happening to all the computers and the major corporations and hacking and how people are getting into your information and da da da. So I want to talk a little bit about how you can protect yourself, okay? Anyone running a Windows computer knows how important it is to have a good antivirus software, but you don't need to pay for good protection. If someone you know still doesn't have antivirus software running, here's a quick guide to um, you can send them to help them get set up. So um, you can tell them a little bit about this class and maybe have them uh, kind of take a sneak peek and see what's going to advantage, um, advantage them the most. Um, so I do have a guide that was originally posted and published in 2011, uh, but then not much has changed as far as needing to have an antivirus. Uh, Microsoft Security Essentials are a very previous favorite. Uh, There's no longer adequately rated the most, an, uh, the most antivirus tests. If you're an advanced user, Advast um, is Life Hacker's personal favorite antivirus program, but it requires some configuration. For beginners, I, can, I can't recommend Bitefender's free edition highly enough. Um, there's different kinds, and we're going to actually look into some of those. But um, in order to set up that bit defender or byte defender however you want to say that uh, you can just head over to their website the free edition homepage, not to can be confused with their premium offerings and download the software double click on the installer to begin the installation process follow the wizard to install the software if it asks you to remove your existing antivirus software go ahead and do so it's generally not advisable to run two antivirus programs at once accept the terms and agreements when prompted all of the other default settings will be fine. Uh, during the installation process, Bitdefender will run an initial scan to make sure your system is clean. When it's finished scanning and installing, you'll have an option to create a Bitdefender account. Most antivirus programs require you to register for free within 30 days to continue using the program, so you might as well do it now. Click the Create a New Account link, set it up, log in, and then you're done. From now on, you should see a bit, a little uh, Bitdefender B icon on your system tray. That means Bitdefender is running in the background, monitoring your computer from any viruses that may come your way. Bitdefender doesn't have many options, which makes it incredibly simple. Just leave the virus shield and the auto scan options on, and you should be well protected. Um, and we're going to take a look at that in our live demo when it comes up for the viruses here. Uh, virus protection, rather. In many cases, Bitdefender will protect you from visiting a website if it detects malware on the page. If you ever do get an infected file on your computer or on your system, Bitdefender will automatically quarantine it. You can see your quarantine items by clicking Bitdefender's icon in your system tray and click the Show Files button under the Quarantine section. From there, you can use the buttons on the right to delete the file or if you no, it isn't a malicious file. Restore it. Remember, good antivirus software is important, but it's even more important to browse the web safely. The best way to avoid viruses is to make sure you don't download them in the first place. Don't click on anything that claims you have a vi that claims you have a virus unless it's coming from Bitdefender itself. Now that would only work if you have Bitdefender downloaded. Okay, so if you download something different, then uh, it would be that particular software. Don't click on any suspicious Facebook posts. Don't click on any suspicious email links. If you get an email from ebay.com, however, your cursor over the link and, um, or I'm sorry, hover your cursor over the link and look at the bottom of your screen to make sure it actually goes to www.ebay.com. If it goes somewhere else, it's probably going to harm your computer. So just keep all of that in mind when it comes to um, looking at antiviruses, but here's some free ones that I know about. 
um, Avast, which we talked a little bit about. AVG is another good one. You do get 30-day free trials with a lot of those antiviruses, and then you would have to pay for the premium. Um, we're going to actually go in and look at finding free viruses. So let's take a look at that right now. All right, so like before, we're just going to kind of get in here and do an internet search on some free antivirus software. Uh, we will go ahead and take a look at that Bitdefender that they were talking about. So let's type that in first. Cybersecurity solutions for business and personal use. That's always nice and handy. Let's go ahead and click on that and go into this and see what all it offers us here. All right, so from here, um, it says it's an award-winning cybersecurity for PCs, Macs, mobile devices, and smartphones. So you can see if I'm going into PC protection, I can click on that. Now, if I wanted to purchase their full suite, it's going to cost me $44.99. Uh, that's good to know. Let's take a look at some of the items that they offer. Okay some of their partners, the company. Um, let's say we're going to go into a home. So this is going to be a home protection, not business. So this just tells it. So you can buy it or you can do a free trial. So that's what they mean about downloading the free. Um, so you're going to get the free. Now let's take a look at um, the, some antiviruses that I know of that are actually free. Let's look at Avast. And Avast is one that I commonly use um, with my patrons when they come in to talk to me about what kind of antivirus they should be using, Avast and AVG. Um, they do, it does do a deeper malware protection. You get un uninterrupted gameplay, fewer clicks. It does have some business security. Um, they have them for your mobile devices as well. Um, it is a free download. Now, here you go. Here's your little chart. That kind of shows you what you're getting for the free. You're stopping, stop anything nasty, capture emerging threats, level up your gaming, and forgot, forget your passwords. Whereas with the next level, which would be on a 30-day free trial, you're going to get those plus some of these additionals um, as well as your premiere. So we're going to go into those cost features and see what it costs. But just to download the basic um, essential of antivirus is free. So I'm going to learn more about this. All right, here we go. Uh, for the advanced, Avast Internet Security for one year, it's going to be $60, and that's just one PC. Um, and you can see the other ones that are on there. So if I went with this one, which is the Premier, I'm going to be paying $80 a year. So you can kind of see the differences. But they do offer you that free trial. Uh, or not free trial. They do offer you a free trial with these other upgraded ones as well, but you can just download the free version, which depending on what you're doing will probably work just fine. All right, let's take a look at another favorite I have. It's called AVG. Again, this is another freebie type antivirus that you can get. Um, or I could even purchase into it if I wanted to. I can protect my mobile devices. This is kind of what it looks like when it gets going. Okay, um, let's see what else we can learn more about mobile app, find out how, services. Um, so you can upgrade this service as well, uh, but just the free download itself would get you going. I do believe with the free download, um, you would not get some of these options, but um, the vast majority of it that you would receive. So I'm not seeing much of a comparison chart here. Let's see what this new renew and upgrade is. All right, here we go. So for one computer for a year, just the basic internet security, um, you're looking at the $49.99. If you want the security suite, you're looking at $64.99. But again, you can just use um, the free version that is as given to you. So if you're not still not sure what you want to do, you can always go into your search engine and just type in uh, free antivirus software. Now you're going to get a lot of the more common ones that are going to pop up because they do offer you free 30-day free trials with a lot of their stuff. 
Um, we're going to look at PC Mag. Um, they do offer you a lot of free trials with their items. So they're considering that almost like a free product. So again, here's that Avast, that AVG. Here's that Bit Defender that they were talking about, as well as Zone Alarm. Uh, zone Alarm is a really good one. The only problems I've ever had with Zone Alarm is that sometimes it wants to conflict with other programs I have on my computer. Um, it's a firewall type system, so uh, you just want to make sure that um, it's not going to conflict with anything. But as you can see, it doesn't have as much availability on it anyways. Um, but here's some of the other ones that you could get into. And it looks like Avast and AVG are the uh, the most used and most dominant ones. So, um, But again, don't take my word for it. Go ahead and get on there and just research some of uh, some of those different ones that are out there being offered. All right, let's get into de-junking your computer. So in this, we're going to be talking about what junk is or what they consider as crapware. Sorry to offend you, uh, but they do consider it that. And again, option one, we have manually remove unwanted apps with an uninstaller. Option two would be automatically remove unwanted apps with programs. Or option three would be to reinstall Windows from scratch. So, um, And we're going to also talk about removing unwanted toolbars. I'm also going to be doing a live demo on here just to kind of show you how you can free up uh, some of that history, get rid of some of those cookies and those caches. Those are all those things that just attach themselves to our computers because we've been on the internet or we've clicked something. Um, and they just get annoying after a while. They may even cause pop-ups and things along those lines. So we definitely want to be taking care of those. Um, so let us talk about, uh, a little bit about how we can, uh, keep our PC free of junk. So, um, obviously you could just install programs that you don't, you can just uninstall programs that you don't want on Windows with the built-in uninstall program, um, uninstaller. Uh, but I definitely don't recommend that. That's a lot of programs, especially those pesky pre-installed ones. Often leaves them um, things lying around in the registry and other folders after they leave. So I don't re recommend using a more powerful uninstaller like Revo. You could just use um, your uninstaller that comes on the computer. Um, now they do recommend... Um, possibly looking into Revo. Revo is just a way for an uninstaller, but you already have that. This would be if you wanted to manually remove the items. You could download and install Revo uninstaller. Don't worry, even after you've done here, you'll want to keep it around. You can start it up, wait for it to generate a list of programs on your computer. Select a program you want to remove and click the uninstall button. Uh, repeat step uh, step three until all the unwanted software has been removed. Note that you shouldn't just run rampant and uninstall anything that doesn't look familiar. If you know you don't want that McAfee trial, go ahead and remove it. But if you aren't sure what something else is, look it up before going and deleting it from the system. Um, it may be something that you need. So make sure that you're not um, removing items that... Uh, that you actually need or controlling your computer. Again, option two is automatically removing unwanted um, apps. Obviously, removing programs one by one can be a bit of a hassle. So if your computer comes with a lot of bloatware, which we're going to talk about in a minute, you may want to uh, you may want a more all-in-one solution. Um, Dejunking is an awesome program, or they have another one called Decrab. Um, it's an awesome program that will scan your system, give you a list of installed programs, software, and check off everything you want to remove. Then it'll get rid of everything in one fell swoop. So you can download it and, in and install the Decrab. And um, I recommend downloading the portable version and unzipping it in a folder on your desktop. That way you don't have another program to uninstall later. Um, you can start the program, let it perform its initial setup. It will ask if you want to run it in an automatic mode, and I recommend leaving this box unchecked. Um, it will then scan your computer for currently installed software. Once it gives you a list of programs, go through and check the programs you want to remove. You'll likely find these items under the automatically starting software category and the third-party software category. 
you'll probably want to leave drivers and Windows related software unchecked. Click next and create system restore point when asked. This program will ask you if you want to automatically install everything or do it yourself. That's completely up to you. Um, if you made the correct choices in step four, you should be fine to uninstall everything automatically and clean the registry. Uh, let Decrap run through the uninstallation process. When you're done, you should have a much cleaner PC. Make sure to go through your start menu and the Revo uninstaller that we talked about earlier to make sure there aren't any straggles you've forgotten. Once again, if you don't know what something is, Google it before you remove it. It may be something important to the system or in some cases a pre-installed app um, that's actually a good one. Um, so we definitely don't want to have to reinstall Windows from scratch, but if you had to, some people prefer to skip the above options and just install Windows from scratch without the bloatware. And again, we're going to talk about bloatware here in a minute. You'll need a window, uh, Windows install disk from the Microsoft, not the one that came with your computer, which likely has the bloatware on it um, and a valid license key, usually located on a sticker on your computer. Uh, note that this isn't guaranteed to work for everyone. In some cases, you may not be eligible for service if you reinstall a different copy of Windows. So be forewarned. Um, there is on lifehacker.com, you can get a full guide to reinstalling Windows. Um, so you can check out their posts step by step for installing Windows um, easily and more effectively. So we've been talking about that bloatware. So now we probably want to know what exactly bloatware is. Um, let's see. Uh, bloatware is basically just junk that's just kind of stuck itself around and, and won't leave you alone. So if you want to get rid of all, some of those items, then you could definitely try doing this. Okay, so how to remove toolbars, toolbars and other bundled junkware or crapware, however you want to look at it. Uh, the second kind of crapware, junkware, is a bit more sinister for free trials of Microsoft Office. Sometimes you download a new program only to find that after installing it, you also have a toolbar in your browser and your default search engine has changed to Yahoo or Ask.com. Often companies will bundle toolbars or other junk with their free program. This allows them to offer these programs to you for free while still making money. Unfortunately, while that's a nice sediment, it ends up being quite dishonest because installers try to trick you into agreeing to that junkware, crapware you don't want. So um, we're actually going to talk a little bit about that um, with those options that we talked about. Uh, you can also download a program called ADW Cleaner, and we're going to look at all of these when we get to our live demo here in just a moment. Um, this would be for a more automatic, um, for a more automatic program, which would be the ADW Cleaner. You can download that, double click on the icon to run the program. No need to install it. Uh, click the scan button to scan your computer. When it's finished scanning, go through each tab. They have a services tab, a folders tab, um, and uh, a files tab, etc and check anything you want to clean. Not everything ADW finds will be considered as junkware or crapware, if you will. If you aren't sure whether to remove something, try to determine the name of the software from ADW's list and search for it on should I remove it um, on a should I remove it web page. Um, again, you can just Google most of that to see what's going to work for you the best. Once um, once you're sure you've selected everything you want to remove, click the Clean button. It'll clean the selected options, restart your computer, and provide a report detailing what was deleted. After running IDW Cleaner, I, um, I would recommend doing one last pass with the Revo uninstaller if you've gone ahead and done that to see if there's anything left over on your system. Hopefully, though, your PC should be clean as a whistle, at least from toolbars, adware, and other junk. So ways that you can avoid unwanted programs in the future. Now that you have a clean PC, it's time to keep it that way. Um, as I said earlier, most of these programs come on the back of something you actually wanted to download, usually from a company that's trying to make money by offering their software for free. 
Many people choose to boycott these programs entirely and only download truly free or open source software. That's certainly one solution, but it leaves out so many great pieces of software that junkware aside are worth having on your system. As long as that program gives you a choice to install the crapware or junkware, however you'd like to look at it, or ignore it, and most do, boycotting isn't necessary. Avoiding junkware is pretty easy once you become familiar with the tricks installers use to get you to agree to them. Here are some things to keep in mind as you download and install new programs. Always download programs from their home page if possible. Many download sites like download.com will create their own installers with bundled uh, junkware, crapware, even if the original download didn't have it. Watch for checkboxes on the download page. Sometimes the option to avoid junkware may not be in the installer, but on the download page of the app itself. Adobe, for example, offers you the chance to decline installing McAfee on your download page. Other apps may offer an installer with junkware, but a portable version without it. Don't click Next over and over without reading. If you don't pay attention to what you're installing, you're bound to install junkware. Carefully read each page of the installation wizard before you click Next. Always choose the custom install option. The custom install option. Never choose automatic. Custom install and almost always offer you the opportunity to, collide, to decline junkware. Read every checkbox. Sometimes they'll hide it on an otherwise unrelated page of the installer. Read every checkbox and uncheck anything that wants you to install something you didn't ask for. Don't click every agree. You know those little agrees that you're clicking? Sometimes an installer will make the junkware agreement uh, look like the original software terms of service. Your brain wants to click agree, thinking it's the only way to continue with the installation. But read closely. If the terms are for a program other than the one you downloaded, you can safely choose decline and continue the installation. Watch out for multiple offers. Just because you avoided one piece of junkware doesn't mean you're done. There could be more bundled apps waiting for you or multiple offers for the same toolbar in the same installer. It seems like this is complicated and not worth the trouble, but once you get the hang of it, it is a breeze. You'll be able to outsmart any trick or installer that comes your way. You can go to freewaregenius.com. It has a great guide to some of the tricks you'll see with examples uh, for each. So check that out to familiarize yourself. You can also try using Unchecky, which will be automatically uncheck those boxes for you, but it's not replacement for due diligence. Good luck and safe downloading. So on the next slide, I'm going to go into, um, oh, I want to talk to you a little, ba a little bit about how you can avoid some of that Windows junkware or crapware that they keep calling it. Windows has a lot going for it, but it's also saddled with one of the computing's biggest annoyances, and that's crapware, junkware. Here's everything you need to know about identifying and avoiding and removing unwanted software from your system. What is it? In simple terms, um, junkware or crapware is software you don't want, but for one reason or another, gets installed on your system against your will. This can range from legitimate programs that come pre-installed like Netflix or a trial of McAfee antivirus, two browser toolbars, auto-starting apps, or something that changes your default search engine. The format category, the legitimate software that comes pre-installed, is often referred to as bloatware. Um, as well, not all pre-installed apps are bad, but more often than not, you'll want to remove 90% of what came on your system. So for that purpose, we'll be talking about some of those unwanted softwares, which we already talked about. So now you know what junkware is, or also known as crapware, as well as um, bloatware, and how that's going to be able to help you, and so forth and so on. So hopefully you have a better understanding of what all this is, but I am going to take you on the journey of let's take a look at what some of this is on the next slide. Okay, so now we're going to do a live demo. Uh, well, it will be live to you once you get on here. Uh, but I want to look at some of these softwares that they were talking about 
uh, that can help us with that bloatware or um, junkware that we keep getting on our computers. So we can actually come into the internet and that's how we're going to start. Uh, okay. And I would have look up this Revo uninstaller, but I also want to show you what your computer has. Oops, getting typing happy. How? All right. So we're going to look at the Revo uninstaller. Uninstaller is what I meant to type. Okay, so I'm going to come in here, and this one is through CNET. This looks like it's their actual site, so we're going to check that out. So from the Revo Uninstaller Pro, or you've just got the Revo Uninstaller, and here's those additional tools that you're going to get with this when you download it. So it's letting you know that right off the bat. Okay. Uh, remove unwanted programs and traces easily. Uninstall programs, advanced scanning, forced uninstall, um, things along those lines. So that's, let's see what this video can tell us. Do you have problems with the uninstall of unnecessary programs? You are wondering why there are still leftovers and difficulties? While removing a simple programs and spent hours of your time to fix the problem, then maybe you need Revo Uninstaller Pro. With its powerful features, Revo Uninstaller is much faster and more powerful than ever. Revo will help you to avoid installation errors and update problems. There is also a portable version of the program, so you can use it wherever you need it. Follow us in the social media and have a great uninstall experience with Revo. Okay, so that gave us a nice little demo of Revo and uh, what you can do with it. So hopefully you have a better understanding on that one. Let's go back now and check out one of these other ones that they had been talking about. I think one of them was actually called Decrap. Let's take a look at what that is, and it's a download.org. Okay, so we can download it here if we wanted to. And here's that removing HP bloatware that we were talking about earlier. Okay, all right, so let me show you another way that all this can be done just by going, if you are in uh, Windows 7, I'm going to my start menu, going to my control panel. If you're in Windows 8, you can go to that charms bar, click on your search feature and type in the control panel. If you're on Windows 10, you can go to your settings and just go straight to the control panel. But from here, I'm able to uninstall a program. So I'm actually able to go in here and look at all the programs that I have on my computer to find out which one it is that I don't want on here anymore or what may have attached itself due to me downloading something um, earlier, which happens all the time. So this is another way that you can get on there and kind of search around and uninstall those programs. So if I decide that uh, I don't want this on here anymore, I can push it and then I would be able to uninstall and it's going to ask me, are you sure you want to do that? Which I don't want to, but if you did, then you would just click yes. So again, this is just like any other kind of searching that we were doing earlier. Um, I want to get rid of junk on my computer. I'm typing in exactly what it is I want to do. And this is another thing that we're going to go into here in a second. And I do see a YouTube video that we might benefit from here. Okay, and I'm going to show you those temporary files in just a moment. Let's go back and see what this video might be able to do for us. Hi, I'm going to show you a very quick way. Hi, I'm going to show you a very quick way to clean up garbage files on your computer and this is something you should do often to keep your computer running at a decent speed because these files will eventually slow down your computer uh, and all you need to do is use Windows tools um, if we're going to use this cleanup 
to clean up your tools. So to get the disk clean up, all you have to do is go to start. Excuse me. You're going to go to all programs. You're going to go to your accessories. And then in accessories, you're going to go to system tools. Once you're in system tools, you can choose disk cleanup. Now, once you're at the disk cleanup selection uh, window, you need to choose which drive you want to clean up. And you want to clean up your uh, normal drive that you use for most of your operating systems and your programs. You don't want to clean up your recovery file at all, so uh, recovery drive. So avoid that. So I'm going to choose C. And here you can see that disk cleanup is uh, calculating how many files it can actually clean up. And this may take a few moments. OK, now once it finished the calculating how much time it would take you to clean up these files and, and calculating how many uh, garbage files you have on your computer, it's going to bring you to the disk cleanup window. And here, in this section, it says files to delete. You can see downloaded program files, temporary internet files, offline uh, web pages, recycle bin. You can add all these to the things you want to clean up. I'm going to add the recycle bin to that also. And if you look here, it tells you in how much uh, information is stored in your recycle bin. And then once you hit OK, you're going to be able to delete those files. And then you will see the window where it shows this cleanup, cleaning up the files. Now that's a really quick tip to help you keep your files clean and uh, you can avoid any other problems like that. If you need any other tips, check out the comment section below or visit delete-computer-history.com. Thanks guys. All right, so that was pretty fun. Uh, he was able to show us, and now I'm going to go through that again. He went to the Start menu. He went to All Programs. He went to System Tools. Let's see. Maybe it's in Startup. Well, anyway, I know another way of doing it. You can also push on the computer. Um, go to that C drive. Here's your C drive. If I right click on it, I'm going to get a menu and now I can go to properties. From the properties, I can go into the tools. Okay. Um, and here I can do a check. And it's going to bring up that same box. Actually, let's go in here. Disk cleanup is what I want. I do apologize. Um, and then it's going to go in there and do the same thing that he was doing a moment ago. So it's going to check all of my security on my computer to see uh, what it is exactly that I need to dump out of there. And I don't know, this may take a little longer just because I have a lot of memory that's being used on this particular computer. But if it gets done here rather quickly, then I'll be able to show you how you can go into that box as well. Uh, but again, these are all different kinds of preferences. We'll just kind of close this out, close that out, move this around. Uh, but at any time, you can come in here and see about getting rid of junk. Here's one for Windows 10. And it's basically showing you the same thing that uh, we went through just a moment ago. Okay, here we go. So it's able to show you that as well. Um, it's still working on that. All right, so if you have any questions about this, please feel free to give me a call. Um, I'd love to talk to you about it or maybe even help guide you through it. Uh, that way you have a better understanding of decluttering your computer. I'm sure this has happened to you guys before. You sit down at a coffee shop on your laptop ready to do some work and, ah, shoot. I left that file that I was supposed to work on at home and I didn't put it in my Dropbox. Well, this is where things like remote access come in really handy. With just a few clicks, I can connect to my home computer and use it as if it were sitting right in front of me. There's that file I was looking for. This is also useful for fixing things that are broken at home or just checking on any downloads you have running. 
There are a lot of different ways to do it. You don't have to use a program like TeamViewer. You can even use something that's built right into your operating system. Whatever you use, though, it can be a lifesaver. Hit the link below to see the full guide at Lifehacker on how to set it up. All right, so we've already touched base a little bit on PC free of junk. Now we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about performing regular maintenance. Um, these are just some topics that we're going to talk about. Maintenance you will want to perform. Updating Windows, running that antivirus software, back up the hard drive, clean those temporary files, uninstall programs, defrag, and maintenance on Windows 8 and 10. So you're right, people talk about a lot of ways to speed up their computer or keep their system well maintained, but Windows has evolved a lot and some of those are outdated. Even worse, some of them are just downright wrong. So um, I do have a short list of maintenance tools you, um, you do and you don't want to run. Maintenance you'll want to do or want to run would be updating Windows. Um, I've said it before and I'll say it again, don't neglect Windows updates. Install updates when it gets them um, and, re and restart your computer if necessary. This will can keep your computer safe and stable and really takes no effort on your part. Be sure that you're running that antivirus software. Um, it's a sad fact of life, but if you're using Windows, you'll probably want some form of antivirus software running in the background. There's no need to pay for antivirus, though. We've already talked about all that. Microsoft Security Essentials is a pretty great on its own. Um, and you can update the Microsoft Security Essentials uh, whenever you need to. Of course, the best defense against malware is safe browsing. So the more responsible you are, the better off your computer will be. Antivirus or no antivirus. Make sure you're backing up that hard drive, whether it's simple Windows backup or an automated off-site backup tool like uh, the favorites we've been talking about, Crash Plan, uh, Backblaze. Backups are essential tools for a PC user. It isn't maintenance per se, but it can get you out of quite a few binds. So um, I definitely can't recommend it enough for you. Clean temporary files with CC Cleaner. Windows can lead a lot of clutter and temporary files laying around your hard drive. And it's a good idea to clean, keep, uh, clean these up once in a while. Uh, so you may want to check out the C Cleaner and see what that can do for you. Uninstall programs. You can do that either manually like I've showed you or download a program like Evo Uninstall, Revo Uninstaller. Windows Add Remove Programs dialog is okay, but Revo Un Uninstaller is even better. Not only does it remove every trace of an application from your computer, but it also helps you reinstall apps you can't find, as well as manage your startup process, which will help you boot up faster and run smoother once you did. Now, maintenance that you don't really need to do. Defragging your drive. Unless you're on Windows XP, one of the maintenance operations people always talk about is defragmenting your hard drive. Times have changed, however, and this isn't actually necessary. Windows Vista and 7 automatically defrag your drive, so there's no need to do it for yourself. If you're on XP, you're not getting those updates anymore anyway, um, but uh, you could go ahead and set that up. And if you're on those old, the newer systems, whether that's Windows 8, Windows 10, um, it does have an automatic defragger in there as well. Clean your registry. You've probably also heard about registry cleaners before, but the fact of the matter is that they probably won't do much to help your computer. They won't cause harm to your computer, but they're very unlikely to get any result in, of any kind of results. So just leave these alone. Mess with the Windows prefetching. You may have seen a few articles about the net on cleaning out Windows um, prefetching the speed up on your computer, but it's pretty much a myth. Not only will you not see any performance gains, but you could actually cause more problems instead of solving them. Just leave prefetching alone. Windows has it there for a reason. You can also regularly reinstall Windows. Sometimes it's unavoidable, but as long as you're responsible about what you install, there's no reason you need to reinstall Windows every six months. Be careful about what you download. Test new programs in a virtual machine and run the maintenance tools when mentioned in the other sections that we've talked about. Um, 
So now in Windows 8 and Windows 10, you can still do some of those cleaners um, and whatnot. I'm working off of Windows 7 right now, but let's see if we can't find a video to kind of help you with the regular maintenance of Windows 8 and Windows 10. That is going to be on our live demo for Perform Regular Maintenance. I was able to find a video on YouTube on how to perform that regular maintenance on your Windows 10. Um, it's very, very similar to what we had talked about earlier. So uh, hopefully you'll kind of get the idea of how all this works. So uh, here is a video from YouTube on how to perform regular maintenance on your Windows 10 computer. Hello. This this is Nick with NicksComputerFix.com and here's a video on how to clean your computer and make Windows 10 faster. It's free and easy. Okay, let's go ahead and begin by moving our cursor down to the lower left hand corner of the screen and right clicking on the Windows 10 Start menu icon and going up and clicking on Run. That opens up the Run command prompt and on the command line here type in clean MGR and once you have done that go ahead down here and click on OK. Now that will initialize the disk cleanup uh, calculating tool and it starts calculating uh, how many temporary files and junk files that it can clean up off of your computer system for you and through the magic of video editing I've speeded this up this can take a, a good couple of minutes to uh, you know a good 10 minutes depending on the speed and performance of your computer once it's done calculating it opens up this window the disk cleanup window and let's move this over so we can see this a little bit better and down here by default certain items are already checked off for you um, I like to go ahead and put a check mark by all of these items um, and get a complete and full clean um, done on my computer so I'm gonna go ahead and put a check mark by all of them and there and also here as well and on the right hand side I can scroll down and as you can see there's two more blank ones be sure to scroll down and get those as well if you're going to do a complete and full cleanup and um, we can scroll up and down and make sure that they're all checked off and once that's done one last item um, down below here it says clean up system files I don't recommend doing this. Messing around with system files sometimes can mess up your computer, so leave those alone and click on OK. And once you do that, you get this last prompt, this cleanup. Um, are you sure you want to permanently delete these files? And yes, I do, so I'm going to click on Delete Files. And then, uh, depending on your system, it takes a few minutes to, um, to complete. And once it's done, it just disappears. It doesn't come back and say it's completed or done, but it is done once it disappears. All right, um, that's the end of this tutorial. Subscribe and like my video. Okay, so now we're going to talk about file sharing between online storages. I do have a class that is dedicated to nothing but online storage and different online storages and things along those lines but I just wanted to kind of brief us a little bit on some of these so some of the different online storages that you can use um, would be the iCloud it's the mystery of the cloud right um, also they have Google Drive OneDrive Dropbox your email system and other ways to share files so we are going to actually look at some of these different file sharing processes that allows us to create documents in one thing and save them to another so we're able to retrieve them from no matter where we are what's nice about these particular accounts uh, is that these are not accounts that are just on your computer you can actually access these accounts from any computer at any time these are accounts that follow you they don't actually follow your device so you'd be able to log into these no matter where you are so we're just going to take a look at um, just these just these certain ones here so let's get started with iCloud and uh, we're going to do this as a demo so you can kind of see the differences between the different online storages 
All right, so we are going to start with iCloud. Um, if you're familiar with iCloud at all, it's basically uh, just some, actually, let's look that up. What is iCloud? Um, iCloud is simply a service that keeps all your devices in sync. In other words, you can share information between an iPhone, an iPad, an iPhone, an iPod Touch, and a computer. The information on each device is automatically updated to make sure that most current information is available for all devices. So these would be all your Apple type products. So if we go to the iCloud on Apple, you can see how all of these would end up syncing together. So if you've taken pictures, you would be able to sync those between other iCloud devices, as well as any documents, PDFs, anything like that that you have saved on your, your device, um, you would be able to access these from any of the iCloud different types of, of um, softwares and so forth. Uh, let's see if I am, here's what is iCloud. Okay, this talks about iCloud again a little bit more. Again, I'm just using a normal search tool to get me through this to determine what iCloud is, what can, I can do with it. Um, and again, this is just internet-based storage, so you'd be able to share those wherever you are. So let's take a look at Google Drive. Again, this is a cloud storage file backup, so you can use Google Drive as a file backup as well since we've been talking about, um, about that. So here's my drive, and I have tons and tons of pictures on my drive here. Uh, let's close this up. Um, if at any time I wanted to, I could take some of these and move them into something else. These little double W's indicate that I used Microsoft Word when I created those. Um, and again, this PDF would be Adobe. Uh, but you can see how it's saving all of mine. Um, anything that was shared with me, I don't have anything. Any Google Photos that I might have uh, that I've put in there. Any backups that I've had. Uh, but I don't have any as of right now. I do get 15 gigs of storage. I can upgrade my storage at any time. You can do this with iCloud as well. And again, this is internet-based. Um, so right now I'm getting the free 15 gigs. However, I could pay $1.99 and get 100 gigs. Uh, or I could pay one, um, $10 a month and get a terabyte of extra storage. Um, if you have more than one type of backup storage, though, that probably isn't going to be necessary. So here's what's on my drive right now. And I'm actually going to go back to my cloud drive because I want to show you, because on that one I do actually pay for... Uh, I pay for extra storage on that just because I have a lot of different devices. So I'm going to get back on here and I'm going to log myself in. And this will kind of, oh, okay. They're going to send me a little code here once I get that code. There we go. I can type it in. And we're going to trust this site. Um, they just sent me that code straight to my phone. And now I'm able to kind of go in here and see what I've got on my cloud. This shows you all of my messages. These would be all of my different photos that I have available to me. Uh, once they load up, I can actually have access to those photos. Uh, this is what's on my shared file. If I go into all photos, again, this is just what's in my shared file. So I haven't really backed this up in a while, uh, but I could definitely do that. I can go into my settings. And from my settings, I can see how much space I have left. I'm paying for the 50 gigs of iCloud storage. It costs me 99 cents a month. Um, but you can clearly see I have plenty of room on here to continue. This is all my available space. I have 47 gigs of available space. Um, I also have uh, the iCloud Drive, which I can click on. And once I'm in the iCloud Drive, then it's going to show me some of uh, the other ones that I have. So I have some pictures in my drive that I just haven't transferred over to the shared portion of it. So once this comes up, you'd be able to see. So um, this is the iCloud as well as the Google. So you can see I've got tons and tons of pictures in here that are just kind of sitting. Um, at any time, I can clean these up. So I can do that off my mobile device as well as doing them off of here. 
Let's take a look at the OneDrive account. I also have a OneDrive account, so we will get into that. OneDrive, again, is just like the other ones. It's sponsored to you by Microsoft. And I'm going to see if I can't find my information to get me in. I'm going to go ahead and sign in. I really don't think I have anything on here, but I can definitely give it a try and see. Okay, so now I'm logged into my OneDrive. It's letting me know because it's a Microsoft product that if I wanted uh, 365 Office, which would be your Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and things along those lines, I can go premium with that for $7 a month. In the meantime, I've just got some very basic pictures in here. I don't use this very often, uh, but if I wanted to, I very well could. And this is showing me a calendar of all of my different stuff here. So you kind of get the idea of how some of these systems work. Let me get myself out of here. You can use these as backups. You can use these as just internet storage. Um, even your email systems. Let's go to an email system. So even my email system I can use as storage. So if I want to send myself things on here I definitely can. So let's say I want to send myself a picture. We're just going to call this test. I'm going to come in here and just grab a random picture. Oh, this is a good one. It's my son. So we will use that. I'm going to go ahead and click send. Here in a moment, I'm going to get an email saying um, test. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> saying test. Uh, here it is and it's actually going to have my picture that I attached. So that's another way that I'm able to send myself materials and store them. Now I can actually come into my email system and I would be able to create some type of a folder to help me um, organize and I might call it photos and click create and now it's created a folder in here called photos so I can move this particular one to photos. So now it's moved it out of my inbox and it has put it in my photos folder and there it is. So there's several different ways that you can actually use online storage for different things. Why don't you right now go ahead and check out iCloud, Google Drive, OneDrive. Another one would be Dropbox. And we'll take a look at that real quick. Oops, spelled it wrong, but it should still. And I do believe I have an account with Dropbox, but I never use it. So um, again, this is just another internet based storage. It's trying to log me in right now. It's whirling around. So now I'm in and now I have different kinds of storage that I can use. Um, I have a tour that I can take, but I don't really want to. But let's take a look at what that tour consists of. Maybe. It doesn't like me clicking on it. Okay. So anyway, that was all about uh, Dropbox, but it's just like the others, so you can actually save some of that information. So hopefully you definitely have a better understanding of your different internet storages now. Last but never least, we're going to talk about keeping your personal information safe and secure. Think you do enough to secure your passwords, browsing, and network? Prove it. Not all computer security is about tinfoil hats and anonymous browsing. Everyone who uses a computer has a horse in the security race. For the purpose of this post, we're breaking down online security into four essential parts. Passwords, browsers, at-home Wi-Fi, networking and browsing on public Wi-Fi. Within those categories, uh, I'm even going to give you a checklist of everything you should do from the bare minimum to the tinfoil hat best. Think you've done your due diligence with your security? Jump into any of the four sections that we're talking about at any time. Password security has been popping up a lot in the news recently, but how much should you care 
um, is entirely dependent on what you do online. LinkedIn confirms compromises. Change your password now. Updated. If you have LinkedIn account, uh, now is a good time to change your password. Up to 6.5 million people have actually done that. The bare minimum of password security. Just because you don't use a lot of online services doesn't mean you can neglect password, basic password security. Sure, you don't need to take any complicated measures, but everyone should at least do a couple of things. Pick a strong password. Regardless of what your password is for, it's always good to pick a strong, random password. Don't use your child's name or birthday. Use a unique password for every site. Don't ever reuse the same email and password combo on multiple services. It might, be, it might seem like it doesn't matter, but if a hacker gets your account information on one site, that means they can use that login information on every other site you've registered on. Keep all your passwords different. Use should I change my password to track security breaches. If you don't keep up with tech news, you'll probably don't see most minor security breaches. To help out, the web app should I change my password notifies you when a major service is attacked or hacked into. That's the minimum you should do if you want to play it safe and secure with your passwords. But you can do better than that. Let's step up your game a little. So leveling up, uh, you're a password pro. If you're the type to conduct a lot of work online, then you need more complicated security measures. With that in mind, you should do the steps mentioned above and a few others. Um, so what we talked about already, and here's some other ones. Use two-factor authentication whenever possible. Two-factor um, authentic authentication is a simple way to lock your computer to an account, so you have to verify your identity when you log into a different computer. Not all services have it, but Google, LastPass, Facebook, Dropbox, and more all do, so be sure that you are using it. Use a password manager. Uh, we get it. You have a lot of passwords and you don't want to remember them all. Instead of reusing the same junky password, a password manager is a simple way to save them all security. Um, I like particularly LastPass, but KeyPass and OnePass are equally solid solutions. So they have different ones out there that you can look at. You can also check for apps on your mobile device. Shut down and unlink services you don't use. If you're the type to try out a lot of different web apps or mobile apps, then you probably have a ton of passwords scattered around everywhere. When you decide you don't want to use a service anymore, remember to delete your account. This way, if the service is hacked, you don't have to fumble around trying to remember your log information. For added protection, make sure you clean up your app permissions on Facebook and Twitter. Use misleading password hints. Finally, don't answer password hints truthfully. Instead, you can use word association or just pick a random response that you'll remember. If you're doing all of everything we've talked about, your passwords are about as safe as they can get. Nice work. Okay. Uh, what else can you do here? Uh, browser security. Password security is just a part of the battle. You also want to make sure your browser is secure. This is... Um, this is what everyone should be doing. That HTTPS is everywhere. You likely know, but now that you should never hand over, know that you should never hand over personal information unless you're doing so over a secure connection. Uh, the HTTPS Everywhere browser extension highlights secure sites and ensure you're always on HTTPS whenever it's available, including on social networks, shopping sites, and more. Log out of your accounts. If you're sharing a computer in the house full of people or you do most of your browsing on a public computer, always remember to log out of any account you use. It's simple, obvious step, but it's worth repeating to yourself um, until you remember. When you don't log out of an account, you're giving authorization to Snoop. Understand the basics of online fraud. Phishing scams, malware, and other nasty things are all easy to detect if you keep cautious eyes on what your browser is doing at all times. Be skeptical of odd emails, brush up on the FTC's guide to identity theft, and don't trust your personal information to any website that doesn't use HTTPS. 
The basics of browser security are great for most people, but if you want to keep the advertiser, the man, off your back, you need to take a few more measures. Level up. Keep everyone from tracking you. We know that pretty much everyone is tracking every move on the web. The data collected from your browsing used for ads, targeted coupons, and plenty more. So you can put a stop to that. Everyone's trying to track what you do on the web, so here's some some so here's how to stop them. It's no secret that there's big money to be made in violating your privacy. You can use an Adblock Plus. Adblock Plus isn't just an ad blocking extension, it also helps protect the likes of Twitter, Facebook, and Google Plus from transmitting data about you. Ghostery. Ghostery is an extension that that's all about eliminating tracking cookies and plugins used by ad networks. With Ghost, Ghostery installed, no advertiser can snoop on what you're doing online. Do not track plus. Do not track is an extension that eliminates sites with Facebook and Google Plus buttons from tracking you. By default, a data exchange happens when you visit a site with one of these buttons, even if you don't click on them. Do not track stops that from happening. Um, next level, go anonymous. Completely anonymous browsing isn't for everyone, nor is it for every situation. However, it can come in handy when you're torrenting um, or going around, when you don't mind to give away your location, and it's just plain that don't like somebody watching over your shoulder. Here's what you'll need. You need a Tor browser. A Tor is the easiest way, is the easiest to use anonymous browser. When you use Tor, T-O-R for browsing, you don't get plugins, your traffic is automatically encrypted, and your browsing is also always anonymous. Use VPN services to secure everything you do. VPN services are a great way to create secure connections across the internet. Using a VPN means you're encrypting all the data transcript online. Use BT Guard for anonymous um, threats. Peer-to-peer -peer file sharing is great, but since it's often used for piracy, you might want to keep your downloads private. BT Guard does just that through a proxy server, which, help, which helps keep you anonymous. This service is $59.95 a year, but it's worth it to avoid throttling from your internet service provider. So, a home network security checklist. Once your internet data is secure, it's time to secure your data on, on your home computer. This means backing everything up, keeping your network safe from prying eyes. If you don't use your computer for much more than browsing the web, creating a couple documents, and storing family photos, then you don't need to do much to keep everything safe. Keep your software up to date. Software updates aren't just about adding new features, they're often about patching security holes. Thankfully, the update process is very simple. On Windows, you just click your Start menu, All, prog all Programs, and Windows Update. On Mac, click the Apple menu and choose Software Update. Both update programs run periodically on their own, but it's always good to check for a new update if you hear about security issues. On Windows 8 and Windows 10, you can just look up that Windows Update security. Change your router's security setting. If you're still running your router's default settings, then pretty much anyone can get into your home network and peek on, in on your computers. It's not hard to crack web passwords or WPA passwords, but you should at least enable a non-default password and network name on your router. Back up your photos and documents. Perhaps you're not all that worried about what happened, what would happen if your $200 computer dies because you don't do that much with it. Still, chances are you have a resume or some vacation photos on the hard drive. Backing up those few important files is easy. Cloud storage like Dropbox and SkyDrive take very little time to set up. Once you do, your few important documents will be saved online. That goes with the iCloud, Google Drive, and OneDrive as well. Prevent downloaded software from installing automatically. Malware often comes in the form of download uh, that you don't notice happening. But it's easy to stop on Windows. Disabling the auto run can stop around 50% of malware threats. And all you need is the free software Disable Auto Run. On Mac, downloads shouldn't run automatically. But if you're using OS X, Mountain Lion, you can set up a gatekeeper system under System Performances, Security and Privacy, General.
Um, this would allow only allow applications from the Mac App Store for added security. These are just basic. If your computer is your livelihood, you need to do a few more things to keep your data secure. Level up. Um, you're a network security pro. Whether you work from home or you're simply on a work computer all day long, keeping your data secure and safe is important. On top of everything above, you also want to add a few more security measures. Create automatic backups with crash plan or some type of backing up process. If your computer contains everything you need to work, then you need a solid full system backup solution. Set folder specific permissions. If you're sharing your computer with a household of people but need to ensure your work documents are safe, then setting up permissions is the easiest way to do it. In Windows, right click the folder, go to Properties, and open the Security Settings. Then click the Edit Settings and select your username to lock the folder to you. On Mac, right click a folder, click Get Info, and change the settings under Sharing and Permissions. For extra security, you can easily set up encryption with TrueCrypt. That's just one of those. You can actually research that a little bit more. Know how someone would break into your computer and keep it from happening to you. It's surprisingly easy to a Mac. Once you know how someone could get into your system, it's relatively easy to prevent. On Windows, you can usually get away with a long password, and on Mac, you can set up FireVault. FireVault to secure your data. That's under System Preferences and Security. You can always upgrade your router security. Um, as I've mentioned before, hacking into a wireless network is incredibly easy. One way to, to secure your router is to upgrade its firmware with the DD-WRT or Tomato. Upgrading your router can keep you safe from at least one type of hack. So that's basically like a checklist for yourself. And the some other things uh, to know about sniffing out passwords and cookies, how to prevent yourself against them. Um, you can, let's say you occasionally check email on public Wi-Fi when your internet is down or you're on vacation. You're always tempting fate when you don't completely lock down your computer. But here's the minimum amount of effort you should always do. Always use HTTPSs. I've mentioned this before. Turn off your sharing. When you're at home, you might share your files with other people on your network. That's great. But you don't want that on public Wi-Fi. Disable it before uh, you even connect. In Windows, open Control Panel, then go to Network and Internet, Network and Sharing Center, then click Choose Home Group and Sharing Options, Change Advanced Settings. Turn off File Sharing, Print Sharing, Network Discovery, and the Public Folder. On Mac, old in the System's Preferences, Sharing, and make sure all the boxes are unchecked. Don't connect to Wi-Fi unless you need it. This might seem like common sense, but if you're not actually using the internet connection, turn it off. In Windows, right-click the wireless icon in the taskbar and turn it off. On a Mac, click the Wi-Fi button in the menu bar and turn off Wi-Fi. Doing these three things will keep most of your data secure when you're just popping in to quickly check your email. If you're using free Wi-Fi in a dorm or apartment building, you need a stronger, stronger solution. So what about public Wi-Fi? If you're on public Wi-Fi a lot, it's best to really lock down and encrypt your data. In addition to the steps that we talked about, um, here's some other ones. Encrypt everything with Hamachi and um, Privoxy, the easiest way to cut off outsiders from peeking into your private data when you're on a public network is with the free VPN Hamachi and the web proxy Privoxy. Setup isn't much more complicated than just a few clicks, and the end result is secure connections for all your browsing. You can also encrypt it in, uh, further with an SSH SOX proxy. Uh, if you don't want to use a VPN, other option is to roll your own SSH SOX proxy. This encrypts all of your web browsing and redirects it through a trusted computer. That's all you really need to do when you're on a public Wi-Fi to keep your browsing encrypted and safe. However, you can take it another step and go completely anonymous. So there's other ways that you can actually do that. Wow, that was a lot of information.
Um, but I think that we got through it, keeping your information personal. It's, a, it's called personal information for a reason. If it was public information, then we wouldn't need it to be personal, now would we? So, again, you can just go into your Internet Explorer, your Chrome, Firefox, whatever uh, web browser you enjoy using. Get on your search engine, which would be uh, Google, Yahoo, Bing, and uh, just kind of look at how I can protect my computer and my personal information. So, I hope you enjoyed this segment, and I do believe that that might be the end of our class. So, uh, applaud yourself. You've done very well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Congratulations. You made it through this entire class. You completed it. You should be very proud of yourself. Take a deep breath and relax. It's all over. Keep in mind, without your participation, we wouldn't be able to have these stream classes or videos. So thank you. Questions about this video, please feel free to email me or call me. My information is listed there. Definitely be looking for other stream classes. And thank you for taking the steps to better, your ed to better educate yourself on your computer and the maintenance of your computer. I want to thank the following websites for their information and videos. Without their information and videos, this class could not have been taken place. Thank you for uh, all your information.